So, welcome to Strong Field Laser Physics. We were talking, or uh, Matthias was actually talking last, uh, last lecture, on the WKB approximation. We were discussing tunneling, first of all, and the WKB approximation is a typical method to, to, uh, well, to approach such problems. Let me say a few words about, uh, about W, K, and B. So if we can show this, uh, the slide. So you have here these three gentlemen uh, that stand for W, K, and B, and uh, I'm sure you know K and you know B, but I'm pretty sure that you don't know the W. So K, you know from optics, uh, this is Kramers, the person that contributed to the kramers chronic relations, but also to other things. Yeah, so he is, uh, he is a solid stand in the history of uh, physics, in particular optics. Uh, the other one is Brior, uh, a French scientist, and uh, you know him from solid state physics. I guess the Brior uh, zone, uh, this is probably the most well-known contribution. Now, um, the W, this is Gregor Wenzel. And let me tell you the following anecdote. It was Lou Koch who told, uh, told it to me. Uh, Lou Koch is some 20 years older than, mine, uh, than myself. And when he was a young scientist, he was invited to, uh, I guess, Chicago University and uh, gave a talk there, and uh, a seminar talk. And he was talking, he was frequently using Fermi's golden rule. And so he would say Fermi's golden rule. And back there in the last row was sitting an old man and he would grumble, my rule. Now, whenever he mentioned Fermi's golden rule, uh, the old guy in the back would say, my rule. And actually, this is true because Fermi's golden rule was not developed by Fermi. Uh, he never claimed that. He just, in, uh, in his famous book on nuclear physics, he called it the golden rule. Yeah? And people thought uh, he made it, but uh, actually it was much older. Uh, it was invented by, by Wenzel and by, by Dirac, independently, I think, in 1926. Um, but this was not only the only, uh, this was not the only thing for which Wenzel should be famous. Um, he, by the way, did his PhD together, or pretty much at the same time, than um, persons like Heisenberg or Pauli in Munich, um, in the um, yeah, in the uh, in the kingdom of so uh, of Sommerfeld. Yeah, you may know that Sommerfeld uh, uh, was the professor uh, who produced a, a huge number of Nobel Prize winners. Um, well, among them Heisenberg and Pauli, of course. Um, he wrote the first paper that I know, uh, which, is, uh, which has the title um, Über Quantenoptik, or something uh, the like, so on quantum optics. And he also uh, invented kind of the path integral, for which, uh, so which later was, um, was used by Feynman um, uh, with great success. Right, but Feynman, um, yeah, so in the, he was also one of the pioneers of quantum field uh, theory. Okay, so you see uh, that he should be more well known than uh, he actually is. Good, uh, so much for, for an introduction for today's uh, lecture. So what's the idea uh, of WKB? Um, Matthias mentioned that already. So let's look um, again at the Schrodinger equation. I just write it down. All right, so we have, we have, I um, need to make my pencil work here. Uh, we have minus h bar squared divided by 2m, and then the second derivative with respect to space. So let's treat things uh, in one dimension. Then uh, we have the potential, which may depend on x in general, right? Um, and so this would be the time-independent Schrodinger equation. And if we want to solve it, 
then a good idea or one idea could be to just assume that the potential is constant and then what we get is just a plane, uh, is just a wave, a yeah, plane wave. Um, so uh, we would have an amplitude times um, an exponential of i k x where k is, is the wave number. And you can easily verify this yeah, just by plugging in um, the ansatz into the Schrodinger equation. So we first do the, um, uh, the second derivative uh, in order to prepare for that. Right? And then if you plug uh, that in, yeah, so we just do this uh, little exercise, um, then we would have, well, um, k squared minus k squared a times e to the plus minus i k x um, equals e minus the potential and then, of course, again, the ansatz, e to the plus minus i k x, right? And then you see that uh, the ansatz was actually useful. Uh, so we can, um, we can divide through uh, basically through the ansatz, right? And uh, then we would find that k equals 2m over h bar squared e minus v. Yeah, we'll come back to, to that, uh, square root of that. Mm -hmm. So um, k is, is the wave number, of course, and the plus minus here in the ansatz, this just corresponds to particle moving in either direction, plus uh, um, x direction or, or minus x direction, right? So um, now um, the question is what would we do? What would we do if, um, if the potential is not constant as assumed here? And the argument uh, may remind some of you who attended uh, my course on nonlinear optics. There we did a similar thing uh, when we derived the coupled wave equations. Um, we said, well, uh, if the amplitude, yeah, so if, uh, if energy is exchanged between these waves, well, uh, so if uh, our, our assumption in this case that the potential is not, uh, is not constant is, is not exactly fulfilled, then we say, well, it's still approximately uh, fulfilled. And so we would make this k here dependent on x. Yeah? In uh, nonlinear optics, uh, we did the same with the amplitude. Right? So we said that the amplitude depends um, on, the, um, on the propagation distance. Yeah? So this is a reasonable thing, but be careful. Uh, here it is a little bit more tricky. Um, but actually, we won't, uh, so we uh, will not fully cover here the WKB approximation uh, so that we don't need to, uh, to address this problem. But nevertheless, be careful. What you see here is E minus V. So when both are equal, and they are equal at the classical turning points of the particle, Right, so if the energy equals, the kinetic energy equals the uh, potential energy, then the particle comes to a rest. Right, so the momentum gets zero and therefore the de Broglie wavelengths would go to infinity. Yeah, so at that point, uh, of course, uh, this approximation uh, would break down. Yeah, so at the classical turning points. Okay, so now we want to apply this here to um, to the classical region of the problem. Classical region means where the energy is larger than, um, uh, than the potential, right? So a classically allowed particle will derive a formula and then we'll just copy it to the forbidden region and um, subsequently uh, one step more in order to, to apply it to tunneling. So um, let me continue with the next uh, subchapter. This would be 3.5. 3.5. The classical, the classical region. 
meaning that the energy is larger than the potential. So um, we use the Schrodinger equation, but we rewrite it a little bit. Uh, we rewrite it actually in a form um, that is already suggested by what I previously uh, said. Um, we rewrite it in the following form. So first, um, the Schrodinger equation, I just call it SE, yeah, is rewritten as second derivative of the wave function with respect to x equals minus p squared divided by h bar times the wave function. So that's supposed to be equation one, where p is what I called k over there, what I called k previously. Yeah, so don't be disturbed by the fact that uh, one of the, um, of the iPads blanks out from time to time. Um, this is a bug, but we don't know the reason of the bug. Um, so P uh, is the same thing as what I previously called K. So P of, uh, to be precise, of X is defined as the square root, well, it's almost the same as K, uh, yeah, so disregarding the H bar. So it's this thing here, yeah? That's equation two. And um, it is clear um, that uh, two is the equation for the classical momentum of a particle. Yeah, so two is the expression for a classical particle uh, with momentum with momentum p. Therefore, um, with momentum p, um, yeah, so meaning it has energy energy E in a potential in a potential V, V of X to be precise. Yeah? Okay. Well, we said, uh, as written in the headline, we said that the uh, that the energy should be larger than the potential. This means that P is a real number. Yeah, so, or a real function. So um, as E is larger than V, we conclude that P is a real number. But nevertheless, um, we, uh, it is clear that the wave function, that psi, is a complex function, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, so psi, is, is a complex function. And now we do the usual thing again. I, yeah, so actually it's a pretty general approach. So what we do, would do next is to write this complex function as a product um, of the magnitude and the phase, right? So we write it as the product of two real functions. Yeah. So um, write, C as product of um, of amplitude of magnitude um, and phase. Yeah, so this means that psi of x equals a of x times the exponential of um, I times imaginary unit times a phase phi of x, right? 
Yeah, so we make the problem simpler. Sounds funny, but uh, it is actually the, uh, the case. We try to simplify the problem by looking for two functions instead of one. Yeah? Uh, two functions, namely a of x and phi of x. Yeah? So uh, this is the next remark here. Um, yeah, in order to find, in order to find psi, we find we will find a of x and phi of x. Yeah, so as a remark or reminder, a of x and phi of x are now real number, uh, uh, real functions. Yeah, so they are real functions. Well, um, this is an ansatz, yeah? and uh, what do we do with an ansatz? An educated guess. We substitute into, uh, it into uh, into the uh, into the uh, Schrödinger equation. So in this case, in this rewritten Schrödinger equation, uh, the equation one. Yeah. So for this. For this, um, the ansatz re is substituted in uh, equation one. And in order to prepare for that, we calculate, um, we calculate the derivatives, the first derivative and then the second derivative. Yeah. So um, prepare for this by computing the first derivative and the second derivative. So the first derivative. Compute, well, that's trivial, of course. Yeah, so uh, we need the product rule, and we also need the chain rule. Yeah, so just um, to write it in full beauty here. And uh, if you do that, then you find a prime plus i times a times phi prime. Yeah, so the derivative of a of the amplitude with respect to x plus i times amplitude times the derivative of the phase. And, of course, uh, this exponential here. When we have the first derivative, then we, it is, also, it is uh, equally easy, just a little bit more work, to calculate the second derivative. So let's do that. And what we get is, well, I leave out a few steps because they are trivial. So we get here the second derivative plus uh, of the amplitude plus two times i times the first derivative of the amplitude times the first derivative of the phase plus i times a times the second derivative of the phase minus a times phi prime, the first derivative of the phase squared. Right? And again, the exponential e to the i phi. Yeah, so let's, let's call that equation 4. So now um, we have the second derivative. Yeah, and you see back there, uh, here on my, on my other screen here, yeah, so if you look at equation 1, yeah, so apparently, uh, so if you look at equation 1, uh, we plug in this equation 4. Unfortunately, this is hard to see here. Uh, so we plug in this equation 4 into equation 1. Um, and of course, also the ansatz 3 into equation 1. So let's do that. Um, so this, the ansatz 3 and 4. Yeah, so equation 3 and 4 in equation 1. 
And then we have uh, the following. We have um, second derivative of the amplitude plus two times i, first derivative of amplitude and first derivative of phase, plus i times amplitude and second derivative of phase, minus a times first der derivative of phase squared, e to the i phi, and now the left, uh, the right hand side, so minus p squared over h bar squared, a times e to the i phi, right? Of course, as expected, uh, e to the i phi can be canceled. And, um, well, then we have equation five, and uh, it's worthwhile to look at it um, a little bit more careful. Yeah? So what we said is that each of these functions, a and phi, are real, which, of course, implies uh, that also their derivatives are real. Um, so um, it is clear that, um, that this here is a, um, is a real function, right? It is also clear that this here is a real function, and uh, this here is also real, right? So um, on the other hand, you see that, um, that these two terms here are decorated with this imaginary unit here, and therefore these are um, imaginary expressions. So you see that we have here an equation um, that is composed of, of real functions and, um, and, and imaginary functions, um, which means that we have, in fact, here two equations rather than one, right? So both must be independently um, fulfilled. So, um, equation five must be fulfilled for the real and imaginary part, imaginary terms independently. So let's write down these two equations. So the real part, yeah, so I underlined them in, in blue above. So for the real part, we would get, get um, second derivative of the amplitude minus A times first derivative of the phase squared equals minus P squared over H bar squared times a, or if we rewrite it a little bit, then we have second derivative of the amplitude equals the amplitude times phi prime squared minus p squared h bar over h bar squared. Yeah, so this is the first equation. That's equation six. Now, uh, the same thing for the imaginary part, or for the imaginary terms, so underlined in red above. And um, what we have here uh, is accordingly two times derivative of the amplitude, derivative times derivative of the phase, plus A times the second derivative of the phase equals zero, or in other words, um, a squared times phi prime, and the derivative of that, right? Um, so if you uh, do this, then you see that uh, you get exactly um, what is written on the other uh, side, right? So if you do this, if you do this derivative, right, you will find that you get uh, this here, of course. Yeah? So equals zero. So that's equation seven. Okay, so we did some work, didn't we? Um, and 
it's um, maybe appropriate to just look back on uh, what we have. So we said WKB approximation. The remark that I want to make here is that so far we didn't do any approximation. But as usual, when I say this, when I emphasize that so far we didn't do any approximation, the approximation will come soon, right? Um, but not immediately. Um, first, first we would use, uh, we would use uh, this beautiful thing here, right? So um, we rewrote um, this expression in this way here, and then it is of course clear that if the derivative of this thing is zero, uh, then this thing is, is constant. But first, uh, let's write down the remark that I made. So remark, so far, no approximations. Yeah. So next we use this fact in equation seven and then um, we continue with the approximation. So equation seven can immediately solved. Yeah, so we know that a squared times phi prime is constant, and we give this constant the name c tilde squared. Right. Why c tilde? Well, probably we'll later multiply this c tilde with another constant, and then we call it just c, right? So, um, that's why we call it C tilde. Uh, we can also write that the amplitude is given by C tilde divided by the square root of the derivative of the phase. So, and just let us add that the C tilde is, of course, in a, a real number. So that's equation eight. Well, and now it comes, it goes uh, to equation six, right? What can we do? So we have the second derivative of the amplitude on, uh, amplitude on, on the one hand, and on the, on the right hand side we have the amplitude times uh, this term here in brackets, right? Uh, again, when you think on what you have done in lectures before, maybe in nonlinear optics, yeah, then uh, of course uh, a good target is this thing here, the second derivative, right? Um, what we kind of assumed already when we introduced the idea of the, uh, of the WKB approximation was that we said that things shouldn't change too quickly, yeah, so, um, yeah, so we started uh, with a constant potential and, um, yeah, um, and just expanded the solution or generalized the so solution we had for that um, to, um, to, to a more general one where the potential depends on, uh, on the coordinate. Um, and this suggests, of course, uh, that we say that the second derivative of the amplitude is equal to zero. That's, that's our approximation. Yeah? So, um, let us write that down. So, six has no general solution. We assume Um, that the amplitude A changes, changes slowly. Whatever slowly is, we can specify that later. Yeah. 
And this means that a that the second derivative um, is equal to zero. Right. So what we really say is that um, yeah, so you can see what we really say. What we say is that well divide this equation six um, to um, through through a, right? So we normalize um, the second derivative of the amplitude to the to the amplitude, and then we say that this should that this should be small to either of these uh, uh, terms to phi prime squared and to p squared over h bar. Yeah. Okay. So, when we made this approximation, then we have, uh, then things become uh, simple, very simple indeed. Um, then we find that the square of the derivative of the phase equals p squared over h bar, or we can of course also write uh, the derivative of the phase directly. So what we have then is plus minus p times h bar, or we can integrate it, and uh, actually we are looking for uh, this function here, um, and we find, well, uh, one over h bar and the integral over px. Um, so Strictly speaking, we would need a definite integral, but of course, uh, I could write here um, another another constant, yeah, so something like that or so, right? Um, and um, well, this will be the uh, this constant, uh, which together with the c tilde gives another constant that we'll call c. So. Well, now we are pretty much done. Yeah, so you see that we have an equation for, well, for a, uh, perhaps I should say of a of x, right? Uh, that we would have here. So we have uh, equation eight, and we have equation, has no house number so far, equation nine, and um, they together make up our ansatz. Where is it? Somewhere here above. Right, let's look for it on the second screen. Right, so we, uh, we, wrote, um, we wrote this, um, our, our ansatz as a product of these two functions. I'm missing a square here, a square, right? Yes. Good. So, let's do that. Um, so, eight and nine into equation three, right? Uh, just as a reminder, phi of x equals a of x times e to the i phi x. Right, and then we get that phi of x is approximately this thing here. And the integral of p of x dx. That's our final result. That's our final result. Okay, well, of course, the general solution would be the linear combination. Yeah, so these are actually two solutions, and the general solution is, of course, the linear combination of both. And we'll take advantage of that in, well, in a few minutes. So that's equation 10. Um, let me, ah, oh yeah, so let's write that down. Yeah, so 14 the general solution of the Schrodinger equation is um, a linear combination, a linear combination of 
um, of 10 with the plus and the minus sign. Now that's, that's obvious. Well, what we see is, uh, so uh, one interesting remark. So let's write down an interesting remark. Now, um, if you remember um, an elementary course on quantum mechanics, then you know, of course, that the probability density of finding the particle is what? The absolute square of the wave function, right? So therefore, let's look uh, at the absolute square of the wave function. And now this is very easy. Yeah? So the absolute square of the wave function, so the probability to find the, the particle at a given position, this is approximately given by, well, this constant here squared divided by p of x. Do you like this result? Yes, quite a lot, I would say. We like this result quite a lot. Because what it says is, well, the slower the particle, the lower its momentum, the more likely it is to find yeah, in a specific region, which is, uh, which is classical behavior, right? And uh, actually, um, classical physics is actually the starting point um, of this um, WKB approximation. Yeah, so um, let's write this comment, yeah? So, this is a very reasonable result. Um, from a classical perspective. Yeah, so the larger the velocity, the larger the velocity, um, the lower the probability to find the particle. The lower the probability to find the particle at a given position. At a given position position x. Yeah? And in fact, you can, also, you can also derive or you can also uh, start the, uh, the WKB approximation from this point here, yeah? so that you require this result and um, do pretty much in reverse what we did. OK, so this was the first part. So I would suggest uh, that, we, that we make a break of a few seconds, and uh, then we would continue with the tunneling region.